You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Find more great shows like this at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. This is another episode of The Path to Libertarianism, where we talk to a prominent libertarian about uh, what made them a libertarian. And we've got a very interesting discussion with Brad Palumbo today. And uh, I said your name right. I should have should have checked. Yeah, you got it. All right, good. Okay. Um, I'm very, I have a bad habit of not checking names and then mispronouncing them as soon as we start the interview, which, which causes a, f- a, a flinch in the eyes of my guests. So uh, really interesting writer and always tweets out some uh, great stuff. And you can follow Brad on Twitter at Brad underscore Palumbo, P-O-L-U-M-B-O. I'll make sure to put that in the show notes and you can check that out. Um, you know, my last interview with was with Stefan Kinsella, and he was an anarcho-capitalist who started. He basically said that if you're a minarchist, you're not a real libertarian. And so it's a funny juxtaposition to talk to Brad today because uh, do you consider yourself a libertarian? You're, you're you're sort of more in that conservatarian camp, along with like Charles Cook and and Jonah Goldberg and some of those folks. Are you not? Right. So. It's a tough question, right? Because it almost depends on who's asking me. If I'm in a group of conservatives and they're asking me, I'd say, yeah, I'm libertarian, right? But if if I'm with libertarians like TM, then I'm like, yeah, I'm a conservative. <laughs> that's what they'll view me as. I'm like, I'm a libertarian leaning conservative, which is really the best way to put it. But the word conservative has kind of become meaningless. When conservative used to mean, politically conservative used to mean small government and fiscal conservatism, I'm that. But like now, what does conservative even mean? I don't know. So it's not a useful descriptor for my own views. Basically, in a nutshell, I am fiscally conservative, very pro-free market and small government uh, in favor of restrained foreign policy, um, and then socially moderate, but kind of almost culturally conservative in terms of being like anti-illiberal social justice narratives and all of that. Um, And then I am pro-life. So that puts me in the libertarian-ish category, whereas on most policy issues, I'm going to be in the libertarian direction compared to where we are nine times out of 10. Um, But I'm not passing purity tests or in down with legalizing child sex robots. So there are a few internet libertarians who don't like me. Uh, just <laughs> so well, I mean, when you advocate for not allowing people to have tanks, frankly, it, it's insulting to the rest of us libertarians. <laughs> the tanks thing started out as a meme, but it is actually a good divide of like, I'm very pro Second Amendment in the extent that I oppose like basically all the Democrat gun control proposals. I think you should be able to have an AR-15, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, I believe there are some limits on some things and that like private tank ownership is probably a little bit past the line. And so for libertarians, that's not libertarian. So that's why I guess, but I almost don't like the word conservatarian because what that word actually means is good and I'm that. But it's almost become like a cringe meme that people like Charlie Kirk and it makes you basically like a conservatarian. It's just like a an edgy boomer conservative or like who sucks up to boomers and like is like Charlie Kirk and um, likes to smoke weed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, and you write for Fee Online, uh, the Foundation for Economic Mm -hmm. Education, and you also are a contributor to The Dispatch, which is basically the last conservative publication that I can stomach anymore. I, I, you know, in terms of where my destination politics would be, I'm probably a lot more um, radical than you. I'd I'd want an anarcho-capitalist society. But in terms of political sensibility, I'm very much in the dispatch, Jonah Goldberg, Justin Amash camp. of You know, I am not pro-Trump and I'm not for whatever nationalism is becoming. Uh, but I'm definitely not a liberal and I'm not an, uh, right. an Antifa loving left libertarian as some podcasters might uh, intimate that I might be. But, you know, so there is a, a weird little diaspora or as Goldberg calls his podcast, the remnant of people who come mm-hmm. from the right, uh, come from the Republican Party formerly who are conservative in their in their personal lifestyle that um, just are not. Pro Trump, it has to. It seems to be as you move in some of those conservative circles and and some of that crowd, 
What's the conversation about Trump like as you talk to those people or the future of whatever conservatism means? Because to me, conservatism no longer really means anything when I hear. I agree. Sadly. Right. Uh, and so it's interesting that, that you mentioned the dispatch because, I mean, David French is very socially conservative, but he's a civil libertarian and a small government conservative. And I find myself agreeing with just about everything the man says or writes, even though we have vastly different personal views and p personal lives. Uh, and, and the same, except I guess we probably disagree on some foreign policy stuff. Um, and then the same is true for Jonah Goldberg, right? And they're both conservatives, at least in their own telling. So when we're, we're thinking of that kind of conservatism, I think I fall under that broad tent. Um, but in terms of a kind of, they're also in a, in a category I would consider myself where I'm not a, a never Trumper, Max Boot, Jennifer Rubin, <laughs> the bulwark type where all of a sudden um, abortion is wonderful, tax cuts are bad. Judge uh, Neil Gorsuch is evil just because orange man, very bad. But then also I'm like nauseated by the kind of the pro-Trump sycophancy and just the, the like constant defending of everything he does. And I feel like there's so few people out there who will honestly say some of the things Trump does are good. Some of them are bad. Here are the reasons why I support them. Not orange man, really bad tweets or the alternative of just everything, fake news, CNN, uh, Nancy Pelosi, AOC, it's like everything is so tribal and partisan. And honestly, it depends on the day whether I'm going to be bitching about Trump or honestly giving him props for some policy move that he's put out. I wrote, I, it's it's funny, in the space of one week, I write maybe five or six articles. And sometimes like one day I'll have one panning something Trump just did. And another day I'll have something defending him or giving him a round of applause for something. So that puts me in a small minority of people that still actually has a functioning uh, brain. <laughs> Do you find yourself, I find myself, I got a text last night from an old friend who said, you confuse the hell out of me. Why do you post such things? I don't understand where you stand. <laughs> like, do you get that confusing look a mm -hmm. lot because you're not in one of the two tribalistic camps? Well, I get a lot of people who will like follow me for some, from some tweet I have, like that's really right wing or something. And then I'll post a tweet like criticizing a Republican a few hours later and they'll be like, Followed you because thought you were conservative. Now see you are total rhino squish lib. Bye, exclamation mark. And I'm like, okay, boomer. Like, sorry, I'm not going to just drink the red Kool-Aid or the blue Kool-Aid all the way. I think those kinds of people are boring, frankly. The most interesting people that I read and that I follow, you don't know what they're going to say because you can't predict, predict them because they're not automatons. Uh, yeah. And that's what, I, that's what I like about people and about thinkers and about writers is actual critical thought. And that requires not being just team red all the time or team blue, even though we all have our tribal instincts. And I definitely lean right. I definitely have a pro GOP like internal bias. Uh, I definitely identify at the end of the day more with conservatism, Republican Party than I do with the left. But I, I really try to combat that in my own head and ask myself like, okay, am I being tribal in my response to this or, or is this actually merited on the merits? Yeah. So let's, let's jump back to, you know, your family of origin. I mean, were, did you grow up in a political household? You know, did you follow politics as a kid? So it's interesting. I didn't grow up in a very political household. No, I'm from New England. Uh, I, I've lived across the border between Rhode Island and Massachusetts most of my life. Went to the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and that's a fun story. <laughs> uh, but so not a very political family. And I wasn't a super political kid or teenager at all, really. But I always kind of was interested in politics. You can go back and find my uh, fourth or fifth grade yearbook. I forget which one. And I wrote that I wanted to be a U.S. senator when I grew up. So I didn't have like strong political views one way or the other, but I just liked politics and government. Uh, and now I, I still like politics and I still maybe want to be a U.S. senator, but I don't like government. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then but what's interesting is kind of my political journey is I very much kind of started out not knowing what I believed going into college. And I was dropped straight into a literal Marxist SJW nightmare at the UMass of Amherst, University of Massachusetts Amherst. They have the only Marxist economics department in the country. And I studied there. I mean, I was an economics major. That's a big part of what I cover now. Uh, and so between the leftist economics and then the really like insane wokeness and super intolerant atmosphere, right? Like you get harassed over beliefs. They would 
like mob people. It was a really sickening culture on campus of intolerance and in left wing illiberalism. All of that kind of radicalized me, to be honest. And I, at first, I kind of knee jerked in the other direction and became kind of like a, a red meaty conservative rah rah type for a little bit. And then over the next few years before I graduated college, the more I read, the more I thought, the more I kind of learned, I kind of great. I am actually probably got more right wing on the issues, but I got less tribal, less Republican, less pro Trump and more nuanced in a lot of my views. So what were some of the things that kind of moderated you a little bit like that you, you went, okay, and I mean, what did you read? What ideas or issues kind of made you go, I don't think the Charlie Kirk's of the world are right about this. I don't, I don't think I'm with them on that. Well, I'll give you a good one is immigration. I started out kind of having what you would think of like a standard conservative view on immigration, right? We need tough borders, very skeptical of immigration. Illegal immigration is really bad. They take Americans' jobs. It's not like I hated immigrants, but I'm just saying I had a very standard position that I kind of just taken by not thinking about it too much, frankly. Uh, but then I, over the next few years, I read a lot. I read, um, I worked at an organization where part of my job was editing and writing op-eds. And I worked with a lot of smart libertarian immigration policy analysts from Cato, from Reason. Um, I read a lot of, of sort of pro-immigration stuff from a center-right perspective, just pointing out the economics of it. And that's what swung me first, was like, you can only look at so many studies showing how legal immigration is a net good for everyone economically before you have to give up this kind of narrative of taking American jobs and America first and all that. I, and I and so that's that's just an issue where I just shifted and now I consider myself very pro immigration, uh, very pro legal immigration. I would triple or quadruple it. Um, I would give a, a amnesty to to all illegal immigrants who haven't committed a serious crime. Um, but but on the other hand, I'm still kind of not full yellow and and gold Kool Aid. I'm not open borders, and I do believe in border security. Um, and so. Well, That's thank you for your time today. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. I guess that's just one example. Other things like criminal justice reform, I really just learned about it. And I, the problem is I was introduced to these issues through the lens of like insufferable wokeness. Mm -hmm. So like when they talked about criminal justice reform at UMass Amherst, they were talking about how evil and racist white people are and how America is basically the KKK and all like, you know what I mean? Like this such an exaggerated, overwoked narrative but then I kind of got back onto the policy train when I really learned that it's a small government case for a lot of these these uh, criminal justice reforms from that like right of center perspective. Like qualified immunity is about hold, uh, repealing it rather is about holding government bureaucrats who hurt people and violate their rights accountable. That's a conservative idea to me in a way. Uh, and so I kind of came back to those ideas into a more libertarian area when I um, just thought about them and read and, and, and really did a deeper analysis and I landed in a, a different position than either, either kind of extreme. Yeah, immigration, you know, I was college Republicans chair in 2004 and that was an immigration gay marriage election and those were the two issues and then that led to foreign policy which led to criminal justice which it's like a slippery slope before you know it you are going to be driving around in your own personal tank <laughs> but you know on you may be a good person to ask about this because i have you know i if you go and listen to this show in 2017 we were talking about critical theory we were talking about cancel culture we were talking about all the stuff that you hear so often from the right now because it's not like it's inaccurate you know you see people screaming in the faces of a fellow progressive because she didn't say the right thing there's clearly a robespierrean uh, a, a jacobin tendency in the far left but my my view on it now is more that yes that exists but we've also created a complete hysteria on the right by nut picking some of those more extreme examples and are creating a bit of our own cancel cultural like you know it, it reminds a lot of what's going on right now reminds me of 2003 in the lead up to the Iraq war where 
you you had to choose your own version, your side's version of performative politics. You were either listening to Toby Keith denouncing the Dixie Chicks, or you were waving a, a peace flag and, and uh, re- reading antiwar.com. Like, there was no in-between. Right. You know, you have an up-close personal connection with some of the that Marxist wing given your college and then also the right. Um, how much of this is a leftist horde is ready to take over the country and how much of it is maybe we're overdoing that a little bit. And is my premise right or wrong in your opinion? Your premise is right. It's a question of to what extent is it true? There is absolutely kind of a right wing grifterdom outrage industry uh, in response to campus wokeness and insanity and intolerance and political correctness if I had to say, I'd say it's about 70, 30, 70% actual problem on the left and 30% overblown conservative response. Um, it's honestly hard to like quantify this stuff, but mm-hmm. to, to give you a good example, right? There was just an article in the Atlantic this week about uh, where, where a liberal author was t- talking about how 150 different academics had come to him that were none of them were conservatives, all of them were center left, and say they're scared out of their minds for their academic freedom on campus, right? It's a very real thing. I can tell you this, I received literal death threats for the columns I wrote in the campus newspaper at UMass. Mm. So it's a very real thing, but there are of course, like these right wing grifters who kind of made a joke out of it to some extent, or like, and that's valid, right? To say say that that does exist. What isn't valid though, is there's kind of like this counter movement in a lot of people who maybe are like either libertarian or moderate or centrist where they're like anti, anti SJW. So they like (laughs) stop caring about the actual problem because they're so annoyed by like Charlie Kirk and Candace Owens. And that to me is also a fundamental mistake because it's not as if it's just college campuses. That wouldn't be the end of the world. But that ideology is manifesting itself in corporations, in boardrooms, in government, in journalism. I mean, the New York Times has just crushed any free thought or difference of opinion on its opinion pages. And and the arguments for why about like endangering black lives by publishing this opinion, 40% of black people agree with when they publish Senator Tom Cotton's op-ed. I mean, that's straight out of, of woke campuses, that kind of ideas make us unsafe sort of thing. So it would be wrong to write off the issue as just an overreaction because it extends far beyond college campuses. Well, it started on college campuses and in 2017, you know, it was just on college campuses and then now it, you know, it's it's blossoming. I mean, there's, I think on both sides, a lot of pr- problematic ideology that's blossoming across the board. When Matt Taibbi and Iglesias and Steven Pinker and all these people are too far right <laughs> for the ability to engage in dialogue, it, it's it's definitely going too far. Um, I wonder, you know, the, the whole idea of cancel culture, you know, you you have a substack, the substack revolution, you know, bradleypalumbo.substack.com. You know, you Check look it at, out, subscribe. <laughs> yeah, and I'll put the link in there. Um, but you look at Andrew Sullivan, who does not, there used to be gatekeepers. There's no walls anymore. And so if you're, if you're Andrew Sullivan, you go from making 200 grand at a place like, what was it, the New Republic or? No, it was uh, New York Magazine. New York Magazine. And now he's making half a million dollars on right. his sub stack. You know, the, the idea of cancel culture, it, they're definitely concerning parts of it. But, you know, the Barry Weiss is the world. I, I, I'm sort of sometimes creeping into that, like, exhaustion camp. That you problem, so so this no, is a good so, point. Let me respond to this because right. you're you're totally the thing about cancel culture is that celebrities are immune to it, really. Like JK <laughs> Rowling is not a victim of cancel culture, right? Like she is immune. She's so rich and so powerful, they can't do shit to her. Right. What what's really disturbing, right? And she just criticizes it because she's experienced the forces behind it. And then people point to people like her and they're like, cancel culture isn't real. You get you do just as fine, right? Andrew Sullivan's land on his feet, doing amazing, got a, uh, honestly more money, like you said, independent, all this. But cancel culture comes for random individuals and private citizens all the time. There's right. another article in The Atlantic, they're actually really good on this subject, uh, where they just talk about stop firing people for no reason. And they tell the story of like 10 different 
people, a lot of them are minorities or business owners who just got canceled by woke mobs and fired by their employers uh, over some thing that went viral that either sometimes it was actually offensive and sometimes it wasn't. But like the point is they did get canceled and that's the real problem. Cancel culture is not actually taking scalps of the rich and famous. What it is though, is, is the same forces that manifest themselves in mobs against Barry Weiss and mobs against Andrew Sullivan, those same forces are the ones that, for example, get a random progressive data analyst, David Shore, fired from a Democrat polling firm or, or whatever it was, because he tweeted out the accurate findings of a study about the impact of rioting on racial issues. Like he just got fired over that. Right. And he's, he's just a nobody, right? Just a random dude. So it's like, those are the real scalps of cancel culture. So that's where this misconception comes from. Because I agree, if your whole narrative is that, you know, uh, Dave Rubin and Ben Shapiro are hashtag canceled, uh, they're obviously not. Like they've got massive platforms, right? So right. that's not what an accurate description of cancel culture should focus on, right? So, so it, there is a valid, a valid nuance to be threaded here. It's it's protecting the innocent. It's it's the it's almost a flip of of the the two tribes where you're taking uh, care of the disadvantaged, basically the the powerless in that situation. Who you know, like a the, who's the Iowa journalist that you know s tweeted something like ten years ago. That's that's where it gets ridiculous and starts to become a, a problem. So how do you fight something like this? Is it literally just you know saying, look, this is this is the end result. How do, is there a solution to it? How you fight it is a really hard question, right? Um, because I guess you fight it by not giving in, in a way, like you shouldn't. Um, but I also don't like to say that because there's this anti-cancel culture tendency where it's like now all of a sudden don't apologize if you said something racist or if you said something actually sexist. Mm -hmm. So honestly, I think the only way for us to kind of defeat cancel culture at large is for to force like the left to play by their own rules a little bit. Like I don't support mobs and boycotts, but it's like so unacceptable that Joy Reid can just have her MSNBC primetime show and she's not canceled for literally having a decades long blog saying horrible things about gay people like me. Like, and she never apologized for it, spread conspiracy theories about it. Yet that's fine. But like Kevin Hart said a mean tweet twice so he can't host the Oscars or whatever. Like there's this total double standard where like the left's darlings just don't have to play by the cancel culture's rules. And as long as that is allowed to exist, that double standard, things won't change. It's only when everyone has to live under cancel culture's horrible rules that people will really start to dissent from it. But I guess to, to the final answer to your question, libertarians and conservatives and right of center people can't fix cancel culture. All they can do is not engage in it themselves, which they sometimes do. Like I just read about a, a librarian who was fired from her job because she supported BLM in tweets, right? Like that's because Republican officials threw a fit in that local area. I'd have to pull up the exact story, but like, so all people on the right can do is not participate in cancel culture, but it's fundamentally a left of center problem. And it has to come from reasonable Democrats, center left people have to police their own and end this madness that, that their side has really descended into. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I, it, 2003, I'm at CPAC, you hear, we need our own restless, r is it restless giant? We need our own moveon.org. We need our own version of these left-wing institutions that target people on the right. And, and a lot of what that's blossomed into is its own version of the same problem. And then you're forced to choose. And it's then if you don't, you're you're in trouble. Um, you know, and that, that I think is where it goes. The right has been somewhat driven hysterical by the hypocrisy, the hypocrisy of the mainstream media on a daily basis is is really maddening for people. You know, right. you look at the two conventions there's two different sets of narratives for Joe Biden's convention versus Donald Trump's convention. And that's a big part of the problem is that, and I tried to tell people left of center that listen to this show, when Donald Trump is held accountable for the most nitpicky, tiniest, dumb thing, people don't care when it's impeachment time finally and when you got it because you've worn them out. They don't take you seriously anymore. And so th that is a part of the problem too is that the, the 
the the constant hysteria over every minor little detail of each side it drives us crazy i agree and it's also it's an interesting problem because um Santa's coming for you or are you uh okay? I don't know. oh no my dog might howl there's an ambulance going by okay uh, that, that, that's what happens when you work from home for coronavirus um yeah. So you're in a major leftist city, aren't you? Uh, I'm outside of the city, thankfully. Okay. So I've been spared the rioting and looting because I live in Arlington, not DC. Okay. Where my DC friends have seen stores on their street literally torched and well, not torched, but like smashed and looted. Um, so back to but back to your point though, like explain to me, and I'm a pro criminal justice reform guy, but explain to me how all the BLM rallies didn't spread COVID and were fine. Right. according to the media, but you can't have church or you want to kill grandma. Like that's the kind of thing that, or like when CNN is reporting in front of a burning building and the caption says fiery, but mostly peaceful protest. It's like those kinds of things honestly radicalize people. Like that's, that's the kind of shit that makes people want to vote for Trump. And it's honestly hard to blame them. Like yeah, that, that kind of stuff is so hypocritical and so horrible and it's so rife in the mainstream liberal media that that is it's a seriously toxifying force on our body politic yeah the the COVID example is a great example because you know my approach to it was i don't know i'm a podcaster in indianapolis <laughs> I, I all i can do is like listen to information and make the best decision like i'm no medical expert whatsoever so i'm willing to like okay all right a couple weeks we'll see how this goes all right, I'm not totally cool with the people in Michigan going up and like you're, you're kind of putting other people at risk. Like this seems if if they're right, then you're in trouble. But then when you get to the BLM rallies and it's not a problem at all anymore and everybody's saying the thing, that was the moment when I went, mm, I'm not taking any of this seriously. You know, I'll, I'll, I believe COVID is a serious disease and it's ser a serious problem, but I'm going to modify my, my behavior by like 25% less. Like I'm going to give more into the white male entitlement side of myself now, you know, <laughs> that hypocrisy just made me go, eh, I shouldn't have really trusted you from the beginning. I should have known better. Right. I mean, and that kind of stuff politicizes coronavirus. So Trump has politicized coronavirus. Don't get me wrong, but so has the liberal media. And yeah. so it's kind of the left more broadly, like, I had somebody, and so I, I, I will say I've taken like reasonable precautions. I'm not at risk myself. Like I'm healthy, no pre-existing conditions, early 20s, like very, very minimal risk, but I don't want to expose anyone else. So I wear the mask. I, I don't go into other people's spaces and, I, and ex all of that, right? So I'm minimizing my risk to others. Um, but I had, was having maybe a month ago, I was having dinner on a rooftop with like five of my friends in the corner. We weren't near anyone else. So all of us were like opting into our own situation, right? So nobody was being exposed to us. We weren't imposing on others. The five of us all evaluated our own risk, decided we were fine with it and we're doing our own thing. And we got Karen. We had some, we had some lady come over to us and start lecturing us. And this was a white woman about how we as white people need to take COVID more seriously and you guys aren't wearing masks. And then she just started going on about how like, it's about white supremacy in our healthcare system and how it's disproportionately hurting black people, which is factually true, but she was making this like a woke SJW victim narrative. And it's like, honestly, all I wanted to, I didn't, right? But this is that tribal impulse. I want to like rip my mask off and never wear it again. Like I'm like, don't <laughs> right. lecture me with your social justice about the virus when I'm doing nothing wrong. So I, I'm obviously I didn't do that. But the point kind of broader is that like the whole virus has been politicized and tribalized and, and there's there's blame for that to go around, frankly. Yeah, I think I think you've got the right approach, though, you know, just give a shit about other people, you know, take precautions, but make good decisions for yourself. We've sort of landed at the, it seems like we've landed as a country at the Sweden model of like yeah. everybody's, everybody, you know, we're going to take the risks and clearly there's losses, but we're not going to, there's significant hardship when it comes to food banks, for instance. Now, they had quadrupled the need here in Indianapolis at Gleaners and double the need in the local food pantries and 300% increase in suicide hotline calls. Right. A real social cost to some of these 
tight lockdowns. You know, I, I, I've kind of gotten to the point and you tell me where you're at with coronavirus. Like, I don't know what the answer is. And it doesn't even matter if I figure out what the answer is or try to say that to my audience. Nobody's going to give a shit because everybody's so entrenched in it's a fake right. virus or you're a bad person. It's, it's <laughs> like, it's not even, it's like, like Dan Carlin says, it's exhausting to do this. Why would you continue to come out and, and have these conversations? Like, where are you kind of at with coronavirus and, and COVID? And right. So my whole thing is a lot of journalists have kind of, after a week into it, were acting like they were COVID experts. <laughs> I honestly, I haven't opined about herd immunity or the lethality of the virus or the prospects of a vaccine or like, like, I don't know. Do I look like a public health dude to you? <laughs> I, I do economics and political commentary on like elections and stuff. And I have well-informed views on a lot of things, but pandemic science isn't one of them. What right. I've mostly talked about and written about is the impact of COVID-19 policy, like the CARES yeah. Act and all the horrible big government bloat and waste that was in that monstrosity of a bill. That's stuff where I, I, know my, I know my stuff, right? I can hold my own on that and I'm not talking out of my ass. But it's a whole different conversation when you're, people are asking me like, what is what do we do about coronavirus or is it that bad or i'm like well maybe you should ask a doctor or a scientist <laughs> but that said we have to the problem is though that that we can't just defer all our wisdom to experts like dr fauci in an office somewhere because they are experts in public health but they're not experts in economics or or sociology or psychiatry right so it's like lockdowns have had all these unintended consequences Right. You like you said, you had domestic violence spiking, suicides spiking, drug overdoses spiking, huge spikes in depression. Like there's so many ripple effects and unintended consequences that I definitely don't support lockdowns in general as a policy tool. I mean, I'm not going to say never, ever do any sort of lockdown or restriction, but this idea that we could just lock down the country until a vaccine strikes me from my perspective, knowing everything I do know about these policies insane prohibition never works if you force people to change their behavior they're going to resent you and they're going to do the opposite if you persuade people then they will act responsibly let me put on my john stossel hat because you mentioned the cares act is it not true that that 600 dollars a week really helped people and the ppp helped people what do you what problem do you really have with the cares act and the stimulus package that was passed oh god do you have all day <laughs> <laughs> So look, uh, in a nutshell, there were there um, conceptual problems and implementation problems. The conceptual problem with the CARES Act is that most of the aid was not targeted to who actually needs it, right? They didn't send out relief checks to people who had lost their jobs because of coronavirus. They sent out relief checks just randomly to most everyone based on their income data from 2018, which was mm -hmm. pre-pandemic, right? So it, it was a scattershot, non-targeted approach. I didn't lose my income or have my income disrupted. I did not need a stimulus check, right? The government shouldn't be engaging in welfare for people who are, haven't been hurt or impacted, right? And then that was the biggest problem is most of the aid ended up um, not being actually targeted to those who truly need it, right? The unemployment was just broken by design. I mean, I, I'm I forget the exact statistics, but I, I wrote so much and did so much on this. And, and the number of people that were able to earn more from unemployment benefits than by working was staggering, right? It was at, at least 60 or 70%, I have to check the exact number, could earn more because when you add $600 on top of what your work already, your state already pays, like that can be $600, $1,200, or it could be $800 and now it's $1,400. That's more than a lot of people earn. Right. So it's like they put the economy into a coma with this broken package. And they also just racked up trillions more on the debt. Like <laughs> sucks to suck, grandkids. Like you deal with it. And I think that's an immoral way to handle crises. I understand this idea, right, that we should run a deficit in the middle of a crisis. Problem is, we all know they're not going to run a surplus two years from now to pay it down. I'd right. be okay with that, but they're not going to do it. So they're just basically responding to a crisis by running up the credit card for their grandkids and setting them up for a crisis down the line. I think that's fundamentally immoral. Yeah, especially with the news this week that the uh, economy is now smaller than our debt, 
which the last time that happened was World War II. They beat Hitler and we got $1,200. It just seems like... Right. And that's it, what happened to Greece and Venezuela before things went very wrong. They passed yeah. that threshold and kept going and didn't go well for them. Yeah, exactly. How do you get it under control? I mean, how when you have two sides that seem unwilling to solve any big problem or unable, how do you start to bring that down and, and get control of it? You know, it's funny. People just tell me I'm a pessimist when I talk about the debt. I just talk about like how bad things are and there's no, but it's like, you don't. The, the, the truthful answer to your question is that we will have a budget crisis caused by the national debt within the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, our entitlement programs will go bust and people will be left in a lurch and then people will take the debt seriously and reform it. And, but until that happens, it's never going to happen, Chris. I, re I hate to tell you this. It's just not going to happen. People aren't going to accept the, the cuts that need to be made, the tax increases or big spending cuts that would need to be enacted. It's just not going to happen until it's too late. That's just how politics works. You know, like, for example, we were unprepared for a pandemic. But after this pandemic, which all things considered, I know it's very bad and I'm not downplaying it, isn't the worst a pandemic could have hit us as, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, we will have more pandemic preparation and plans and funding and all, and we'll be much better prepared next time because we've had it and it sucked. That's what's going to have to happen, frankly, for our national finance to get under control because until people feel the pain, they're not going to be willing to make the sacrifices. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think the political realities of a politician coming out and saying, some of you aren't getting your Medicaid checks. Some of you aren't getting your social security checks. Sorry. I can't imagine on either side any of those. And that's why the, the courage conversation needs to take place on on all sides, right? Like Because there's going to come a time where we're going to have to talk to each other with, with courage and niceties because there's real problems uh, ahead. Uh, you are a professional writer, are you not? How, how did you, you know, I, you look like you're in your mid-20s, um, you know, early 20s. Uh, you, you seem to have started a career as a writer, and uh, you're doing it full-time. How did you develop into something that most of us dream about? It seems like a great, great career path that you built for yourself. How'd it happen? I'm very lucky, first of all. Um, I've worked very hard, and I, I'd like to think I have talent, but I'm very lucky and very fortunate to be able to do what I love every day and make a living out of it, because I do just write. That's, my, that's, that's what I do. Uh, the long and, and short of it is that I started in college as a campus newspaper columnist, writing every week for my student newspaper, and I fell in love with it. So I started editing and writing more for the student paper. Uh, I was a shit stirrer, so I started a lot of controversy. And if you want to do op-ed and, and column writing, which is what I do, You've got to have that knack for controversy and you've got to be also, um, oh, what is it that Dana Lash says? Whatever you think of her, she has this great phrase. She's like born for the storm, right? I'm like, that sounds dramatic, but that's really what you got to be, right? You have to be ready to dive into the Twitter mob head first when you have an opinion that, the, that people aren't going to like. Um, and then I, in, interestingly enough, I joined a program called Young Voices, young-voices.com. And it's a, it's a nonprofit media organization that I later worked on the staff for that f for free provides, uh, if you're accepted to the program, for young libertarian writers, they basically teach you how to be a professional writer and help you get your first articles published. And that's how I, I made it. And then I wrote more and more through the end of my college career. And then after college, completed a media and journalism fellowship through the Charles Koch Institute. Uh, and that placed me in a one-year fellowship at the Washington Examiner, right, which got me my first real media job. Um, and then I kind of, that took me over the edge and I made a lot of contacts in conservative media, right, to center media. Uh, so now I'm able to write, thankfully, for The Dispatch, for National Review Online. Um, I've written for other outlets in the past. Uh, and of course, the Foundation for Economic Education, great for libertarian writers, especially, um, because one of my main focuses is economics. So uh, that's kind of where I landed where I am. It's not easy to make it as a writer, but but if it's what you want to do, you and it, it, you'll know pretty quickly whether it's going to work out for you and and you just got to stick to it if it's what you love. Um, and hopefully it works out for people. Yeah, it's like, do you have the emotional fortitude to open up your social media? and be yelled at and told you're awful. Every single day. I wake <laughs> up every morning and somebody's mad at me. 
I mean, you just have to be ready for it. You just have to. No, no. Like, to be honest with you, we're laughing about it. But it, it, I've had some horrifying experiences. Yeah. I've had people. I've had. I have. I've had the Daily Stormer, the website of the KKK, basically write an article about me saying that I was a a gay sex criminal pedophile who was enslaved to the Jewish mafia because the Washington Examiner is owned by a Jewish. Um, uh, like owner who owns the company, right? And they literally were calling, people were calling the office and harassing me and harassing the office and like sending mail to the office. Like, like I've had some disturbing shit and don't even let me tell you about all my friends who are women, right? Oh. Like, oh, like I have, I have, I have good friends who are talented, you know, conservative or libertarian writers, commentators, media personalities. They get it worse, frankly. They get constantly like creepy dudes sending them, gross pictures or sexually harassing them online or demeaning them for their looks all the time. So it's like, you really have to be a thick skin person and you have to, you have to want to do it enough where like, frankly, I say this and it's, and maybe, I, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm, you, I'll get your podcast rated past PG 13 and the kids won't be able to listen anymore, but you got to be an attention whore. And if mm -hmm. you're not, uh, then because you, you're going to have to deal with a lot of bad attention to get the 20% good attention that people actually want. So if you can't deal with the 80%, then this just isn't for you. Yeah, your percentages are right on. I mean, how do you emotionally deal with that? How do you separate it in your personal life? Or have you gotten to a place where you can? That's a constant journey for me. Honestly, that's something I'm trying to improve every day. And I feel like I've gotten better at in my life is kind of having a like work-life separation. where Whether that means you don't check Twitter very much on the weekends or you shut your laptop at 8 p.m. and don't look at it again. Those are the kind of things I've tried to do and, and that you have to do. Um, and the other thing is you just, you just get numb to it at a certain point, to be honest with you. Like I don't even read the fit. I read sometimes I'll see Twitter replies because I'm on there. I don't read the comments on my articles on Facebook. I don't read the comments on my articles on the website. I don't read the comments uh, on Reddit. I don't read the comments on YouTube videos I'm in. You just can't. I mean, you just like people are so toxic behind a screen that you just can't even give them the time of day. You have to just become totally comfortable with yourself and who you are. And you have to feel good about yourself and be independent in your own self-esteem to the point where people saying bad. I mean, once in a while, to be honest with you, someone I respect will say something really nasty about me or somebody will say something that they won't realize, but actually randomly hits home for me because mm. of something in my past or my personal life or something like that. And I'll get upset. But like 95% of the time, it's just like, just numb at this point. I'm just like, okay. And I just also, you got to be liberal with that mute button, bro. Like, <laughs> when, like I, I take pride in the fact that my tweets, it will show me, oh, there's 42 replies and I'll look and there's like eight because all the people that have notifications on for me and reply to every tweet trolling me, there's a lot of them, first of all. And those people like get a life, dude. But also you just got to mute them all and don't feel bad about it. Yeah, the um, Brad and Chris's guide to surviving the internet during a, a presidential election hit the low quality filter because then that that automatically mutes some of that stuff and unfollow all your Facebook posts. Say the most offensive, like controversial thing, unfollow it. You won't even remember that you posted it. It's great. Um, I basically don't use Facebook. Yeah, good. It's it's the worst. It's the biggest of the trash heaps. But it's also a really, really big platform for traffic and articles. So I really wish I had a more of a presence on there, but I don't. So instead of reading the opinions of people who read less than you, what do you read? How, what's your news diet like? Um, so this is, a, this is a good question. I read basically two kinds. I, I have maybe three kinds of, of media that I consume. I consume a lot of email newsletters. Mm -hmm. uh, that are either generic or targeted to my interests. So like I read like the morning brew daily uh, economic news. I read the morning dispatch, which has like political news. That's from the dispatch. That's really good. It's, it's pretty straight and narrow and, and pretty serious and sub substantive, but it requires a paid subscription. Um, I read Axios. So I read the, that for kind of like email newsletters to me have really been a good thing, a good development. But then I also read kind of... Um, Basically, most days or every day, I read the Wall Street Journal, National Review, the Washington Examiner, um, Reason, 
kind of those sources. I'm checking a lot, keeping up with what's going on, reading the editorial pages. And then I do read um, the New York Times and the Washington Post somewhat. So I'm, I'm reading a lot of, of those kinds of sources and those things. And then I consume a lot of like new media, podcasts, YouTube, um, a lot, a lot of that stuff. I really, I really find more value in that a lot of the time, frankly. I don't watch television ever, like in like terms of cable news, never. I'll watch a clip from something if it goes viral once in a while. But like to sit through all those commercials, first of all, why would anyone who's not a boomer do that? And also it's like, <laughs> I have, I've done cable TV spots and it's like, they're like, all right, you got three minutes. It's like, you can't have a nuanced or interesting or substantive conversation, right? It's just serving up bait for the boomers and the base. And, and there's nothing of value on cable news 99% of the time. So don't bother with that. Find YouTubers and podcasters who have discussions and are thoughtful and, and, and follow those people and support those people. That's also the other thing is like, you can't bitch about how, how bad the media is and how much journalists suck if you don't pay for any news or media service. If you, like you, what you have to do is vote with your wallet. Yeah. Like that's the great thing about Substack. It's like, oh, well, modern journalism sucks. So someone like Andrew Sullivan gets pushed out of New York Magazine. Well, the great thing is that people can all just subscribe to him and then he can still have his platform. But if you don't do that, if you're not willing to do that, and a lot of people aren't, then you know what? Stop whining about how bad the media is because you're not putting your money where your mouth is. Uh, and part of the reason that the media sucks is because they're just chasing mass clicks for profit and ad revenue because they don't have people who are willing to pay subscriptions anymore. Yeah, I think that and and I've you go into the Indianapolis Star, which was a Gannett product, and they have several TVs with the highest clicked articles, literally the incentives. And as libertarians, we believe incentives are at the core of everything is get the most clicks. And so it's what you click on that, you know, so is the Substack revolution, you know, people like the dispatch. I saw our, our mutual friend, Hannah Cox is starting a Substack. You have a Substack. Um, this new model of journalism based around email newsletters and, and giving incentive directly to the journalist is that the future of media? Is that where we're going? This, or, or will the New York Times ever correct itself, quote unquote? I don't know. I can say I hope so. I don't know that Substack in particular is the future. I wouldn't be willing to make that claim. Maybe it is. I hope it is. I think it's a cool thing. But uh, like alternatives to bypassing traditional media like YouTube and podcast and Substack and all these things, that is going to be a big part of the future. Right, media gatekeepers are losing their monopoly fast, and they're never getting it back in terms of that. So, uh, people are going to circumvent the establishment media more and more and more as it becomes more partisan and more clickbaity. And it, it, like you mentioned, the Indianapolis Star, I don't even know their ideological leaning, but like that's true for every newsroom I've ever been in. That was true at the Examiner, and I'm, no shade, I love the Examiner, I love the people there. But like that's how the modern newsroom works: is they have those boards up with the top clicked articles. And that's a huge part of it's, it's less about is the content good? And it's more about is the content attracting audiences? And those two things don't always go together. In fact, sometimes they're in diametrical opposition, frankly. Yeah, really, at the end of the day, it's like the problem is voters. It's not just the politicians. It's, it's I what say that and people get mad at me. The problem is voters and Americans. It's like, like people are like, the media sucks, Brad. Why you're a journalist? Why are journalists suck so bad? I'm like, well, the American people vote with what they choose to click on and choose to subscribe to and choose to watch, and then what they choose, journalism produces more of that because it's a market, it's an industry. So you're all so unhappy with the product, but it's the product that you demanded. So you can't just expect journalism to just start supplying something different than what the demand is for, which what, and that's what people really ask for when they criticize the media. It's like, no, you got to change the, the consumption and viewing habits uh, of the mass public and, and of media consumers in order to get a better media. So you've got some, you know, freedom in what you write how much of that tension between I need to build an audience so I can eat versus this is like, I'm going to feed them candy to get money versus you need to eat broccoli. So you live longer. Like how, how does that factor into what you write? How do you decide what to write? 
you know, given, or do you have editors who assign you things? Like what's your writing process like? No, I've always been, been, had, had a lot of editorial freedom, uh, which is cool. So I'm, I'm lucky in that sense. I've not never had a lot, every place has a little bit, right. But I've never had a lot of restrictions placed on me, but it is about like, it's not about, so it's about, um, think about it. Like there's three circles. There's one stuff that will get really good traffic. There's another, there's another circle that's stuff I know I could write well and I'm interested in. And then there's another one where it's stuff that is serious and worth writing and policy based and an important issue worth covering. And it's like, those are three circles, right? And then there's like a small Venn diagram in the middle, uh, like of overlap. That's what I'm constantly going for. I'm, I'm like working with three pieces of pu uh, puzzle pieces in my brain, trying to balance them out. W is there an audience for this? Because it's honestly like selfish and pretentious to write something I think is great if no one's going to want to read it because it's about French literature history in the 19th century and what it says about some obscure show or something like, and, and there are writers that do that kind of thing. And I roll my eyes at them. Then on the other hand, it's like, if all I wanted was clicks, I'd just go be Charlotte Kirk. Like I'd just go like hop on the Trump train, talk, just like tweet in all caps. Like that's an, uh, but then you're betraying kind of your desire to have a serious and thoughtful career and do meaningful work and, and not be, and, and be like a very, a more, that's important to me. That's part of my value system. So it's all about striking the perfect balance between those three, which I haven't always done, but I think I'm able to do well enough. And I think that's where a lot of my success has, has come from. So what are the things you enjoy writing the most about? You mentioned economics. Is that kind of number one? So that's interesting because I kind of have maybe three or four big buckets. Mm -hmm. um, I really enjoy writing about uh, free market economics right at a very top line level. So the sense, the sense of like, not niche, nerdy academic economics, but like the economics of everyday life. So like the CARES Act. So like uh, the CDC just passed this rent moratorium that's going to be really crazy. And I just wrote about it. Uh, and so kind of things that are in the top line news, but are economic issues, making kind of a conservative or libertarian free market argument about it. That's something I really enjoy doing. Um, I don't enjoy getting super into the weeds, but uh, so that's one thing. The other thing I really like writing and thinking about is kind of this question of, of how you balance a society between religious freedom, the First Amendment, and LGBT rights and equality in an open society. Because that's something that's unique to me, kind of as, as a gay person who's libertarian and right wing. Um, I believe in religious freedom and the First Amendment and the kind of like modern left wing LGBT orthodoxy really doesn't. But at the same time, the kind of right wing orthodoxy can be out of touch. Uh, it can be, I think, wrong on issues like opposing gay marriage for the ones that still do. It can be cruel in t terms of how they sometimes talk about transgender people. Um, so I think that's a really interesting to write issue to write about or think about. But like the common thread here is, and I tell this when I talk to young writers, I am a young writer, but like younger writers. All right. It, what do you have something unique to say about? And that's the thing you should write about because I like, I, I, and I do this, I write generic takes sometimes why California's anti-freelancing law is bad, right? <laughs> it's like, that's fine. That's a six out of 10 article, whatever. But it like, um, isn't unique. You're not saying anything special, right? Like, whereas I've written personal essays about why I think um, even libertarians should support banning conversion therapy for minors because it's a violation of the non-aggression principle. Though I didn't use that wonky language and don't use philosophy in mass writing. Uh, but like, like different things like that, where you have some sort of personal connection. I've written about the cost of college and how I went to a, a college where they just wasted money left and right. And how Mitch Daniels at Purdue University has run like a very tight ship and he's gotten the cost of college way down reduced student loans a lot through fiscal conservatism. Like anything where you've got something unique to add. And, and the, the, the problem that a lot of young writers fall into is like leaping into why Trump should be elected or why socialism is bad. And I'm a 19 year old and I'm here to tell you all about the evils of Karl Marx that I read about last week. But you right. also shouldn't just like focus on stupid stuff 
like when I was in college, I, I did a whole article and a t TV interview about Care Bears on campus and how they put Care Bears on campus and how I thought that was stupid and snowflakey. And it was, but also like, I definitely got way too outraged over it and it was dumb. So it's like, don't do that either. You know what I mean? It's like about this third way. And that's, that's my advice, I guess. How do you find that voice? How do you find that thing that, you know, makes you special? Like Stefan Kinsella is the IP guy in the libertarian world. And he's like, well, I'm sure if I research hard enough, somebody's written around about the anarcho-capitalist view of IP. And it's like, nah, bro, nobody else did that. Like, but he stumbled into it. You know, that was his process. And we talked to him about that. So I'd refer people to that because it's very similar to your, your story where it's like, you took that interest and you turned it into that thing. But what's the process to get there? Um, some of it's trial and error. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> some of it's trial and error though, in the sense that like, if you try talking about a bunch of different things, you'll notice what resonates and what doesn't. Yeah. Right. Like what people are interested in hearing from you about and what they're not. So you don't want to just give in fully to that and just start chasing clicks or whatever, but that is a useful metric. It's like, what it, what are my readers actually finding most interesting about me? What articles are getting most traffic? Or like if you're writing for a campus newspaper, which I highly recommend any young writer does, uh, look at your website traffic, right? Maybe when you write about this one issue, you're getting twice the normal traffic, 500 clicks instead of 200 for your campus newspaper or whatever. Maybe write about that issue more if it's one you like and care about. And on the other hand, I, I go back to this like... Um, Oh, it might have been Buckley who said it. But so it's like, how am I going to write two columns a week? And it's like, think about the two things that piss you off. There are your topics. There's always going to be stuff that makes you angry. And I, I don't, I don't want to encourage people to be too negative because there's way too much negativity in our politics. But at the end of the day, like 80% of the time when I'm selecting a writing topic, it is because I come across something in my reading or consumption where I say that's ridiculous or that's wrong. Or why don't they understand this? And I and, and then honestly, like that's where some of the best ideas I've ever had have come from. It's like you're seeing wrong opinions and you don't see anyone saying your opinion. That's right. And okay, maybe that's something you should go talk about. So let's talk about more of the deeper knowledge. I mean, what were the books that you read that kind of put you on this path that if you were to recommend a few books, like what were the mind bending, mind expanding books that that uh, really helped you see the world in a different way? So I have never been a huge philosophy person, but I read a lot of economics. And so like, actually this is funny, right on my desk, Thomas Sowell, basic economics. I got Milton Friedman, like those kinds of things. I have to say to any young person, especially, I don't care what your political views are, go read a Mil one, at least one Milton Friedman book, right? Go read Free to Choose or Capitalism and Freedom or, and go read Thomas Sowell or two of his books. Like you've got to understand this stuff and educate yourself in economics if you want to argue about politics and about policy in particular. Uh, and so I think that that's kind of the biggest thing, right? So I, I've read Hayek, um, I've read some Mises, I've, I've read some of the Austrian school stuff. Um, and then Sol and Friedman are kind of the two biggest ones that I most frequently read and cite. Uh, and honestly, it, that kind of thing. But I think that stuff happens organically. Like, I don't think there's a list of books you need to read before you write your first opinion column for, you know what I mean? It, it, it's not like that. And, and you also don't want to get because part of being a journalist or a commentator or a, a personality is that you're essentially serving as, as I think it was Hayek actually, who, who called them secondhand peddlers and ideas. Mm -hmm. So if you want to just be a philosopher and a nerd and an academic, that's cool, but you're not going to be a newspaper columnist and you're not going to be a television host, right? Like the, or a YouTube star, maybe you will, but you'd be the exception, not the rule. Mm -hmm. The class of people who are prominent columnists and, hosts and everything are like the translators who take the ideas and the nerdy stuff, break it down and bring it to the public. And like, that's how I view myself. So I, I don't view myself like I'm never, I don't, I'm never going to be remembered as like Hayek or one of these like great intellectuals. And I don't think I am, but if I could be remembered like a version of Charles Krauthammer, right. Who, or, or George will, or someone in my own way that, that just spread their ideas to the public for decades and reaching millions and millions of people, uh, that'll be enough for me. And I think that's what journalism's all about. 
All right. Well, Brad Palumbo, we're rooting for you. We're eager to watch your career. You have a bright future ahead of you. Always insightful on Twitter and in his email newsletters. All the links are in uh, the show notes. So go click follow. If you enjoyed this, let him know. And uh, please feel free to share it. Final pitch, you know, shameless self-promotion time. I, I just gave you a good plug here. But like, you know, what would you say to the world? You know, you're talking to the entire world right now. You know, if there's like one central message that Brad Palumbo is trying to get out to everybody, what is it? Oh, geez. Take off your red hat and your blue hat and think for yourself uh, and learn economics 101. That, that, those are the two things that if I can achieve, if I can accomplish in my life and I can brainwash you all with like very basic economics and to not just think in terms of tint red and tint blue, I'll be happy in my life. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us here on We Are Libertarians. Yeah, thanks for having me, man.